Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhad. In this session, we're going to look at the auditor's responsibility for assessing and documenting, assessing and documenting the risk of fraud and detecting material misstatement due to fraud. So what is the auditor's responsibility when it comes to fraud? Now, before we proceed any further, uh, I just want to let you know that this is this series is part of the fraud auditing. So this this will be the third section. Basically, we, we looked at the fraud triangle, which we're going to use some of the information in this session, and we look at fraud auditing in general in part one. So this is a part three uh, lecture. Now, the first thing we want to understand is, as we mentioned in the prior session, fraud is different than error. Fraud is hitting. So fraud, in contrast to error, it's an intentional concealment. So it's going to be a little bit harder for the auditor to do what? To catch the fraud. So that's the first thing we want to keep in mind. Therefore, when the what is the auditor responsibility? The auditor has responsibility to plan the audit to obtain the keyword is reasonable assurance. Whether the financial statements are free of material misstatement, whether caused by error or fraud. So what is the auditor responsibility? The, 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 the general rule is we have reasonable assurance reasonable assurance. Why reasonable assurance? Many reasons. Again, reasonable assurance because we, we sample. Reasonable assurance because it, the fraud is on purpose hitting. So it's not like something commit frauds and le they leave the evidence behind. So even though we might perform a quality audit, we cannot guarantee results. Now, if we're looking for audits, if we're looking for fraud, specifically for a fraud, then it's different. But if we're conducting the audit, we only re provide reasonable assurance when it comes to fraud. Okay? Why? Fraudsters might, might hide evidence. They could shred document, forge document. And the hardest thing with fraud is when you have more than one party colluding with each other. So what is our job then as auditors? Well, our, our auditor is to anticipate what is the most likely place that the fraud could occur. And that's why we study the internal control, because based on the internal control, we can see weaknesses in the system. And if we see those weaknesses, we can predict where fraud can potentially take place. So we can anticipate, we'll try to anticipate the fraud. Also, we need to use what's called professional skepticism. What is professional skepticism? Auditing standard required that the audit be planned and performed with an attitude of professional skepticism. Well, professional skepticism involves two components. One is when we conduct the audit, we conduct the audit use uh, we, uh, having a questioning mind, basically questioning the evidence, questioning what we are told, questioning the numbers that we are looking at, and critically evaluate the audit evidence. Now, professional skepticism is a topic on its own. And in this session, I'm going to be referring you to other recording, unfortunately, because if I want to explain professional skepticism in detail, it may take 10 to 15 minutes, because that's what you need to know about professional skepticism. But I do have under my audit audit course, if you, if you YouTube professional skepticism and professional judgment and auditing, you can find my recording. And there's almost 14 minutes explanation of what we call professional skepticism. So that's how we need to approach the audit. Now, so as we are assessing the fraud, we need to know what are the sources of information. So we need to assess if there's any fraud risk factors. How do we, wh where do we go? Where do we assess? Where do we, where do we look? Where do we look for the information? What is the sources? Sources is, where do we look? Well, we're going to look at five different places. First is we're going to communicate among the audit team. Basically, the audit team, the staff, maybe the manager, even the partner, if, if the partner is involved, they're going to communicate among the, amongst each other. So this is communication among the team. And I'm going to expand on this. Inquiries of management, basically ask management. I'm going to I'm, I'm gonna expand on this. We're going to do analytical procedures. We'll expand on this a little bit. We're going to look at risk factors, the risk factors that we saw in the prior session, incentive and opportunity. Again, you have now you have to refer to the prior session and any other information. Let's start with looking at communication among the audit team. What does it mean, communication among the audit team? Do you need to buy a van? Not at all. What's this van for? Well, my first audit, I'm just going to give you an idea. My first audit was a small home owners association so my first audit ever one when they sent me on the first audit it was a small home owners association so it's it was supposed to spend one day at the audit and finish the whole audit it was uh, obviously i was there among two other individuals a senior auditor and i believe a manager was, was with us yes the manager the senior auditor, and myself we were three individuals working on that audit and i remember we took a van the manager's van I believe it was the senior auditor. It doesn't matter, but I remember we were in a van 
and we get stuck in traffic. And the manager says, let's go ahead and start to brainstorm uh, about what what fraudulent activity could take could take place at that audit and basically as we were sitting in traffic we were discussing what could happen you know what are the potential fraud that could take place at this homeowners association so this is what communication among the team now this was a small audit it was just one day we could finish everything in that day all three of us but this is what we mean by discussion now obviously if it's a bigger if it's a bigger audit then you have to sit down maybe have an official meeting but regardless we did, we did document what we talked about but the point is uh, the the uh, the audit was a small audit so communi communication among the audit team basically discussion among the team member basically brainstorming uh, put yourself in the in the uh, in the manager's shoes in the manager of this homeowners association what could you do to to either commit fraud or misappropriate asset because our job was to do the audit for the homeowners association therefore our job is to think about how can fraud takes place therefore we can try to detect the fraud so this is what communication among the team members mean okay how and where the entity financial statement may be susceptible to material misstatement due to fraud where can we find the fraud are they overstating their asset are they understating their income where, where, where could fraud occur how management could perpetrate and conceal fraudulent financial reporting put yourself in the management shoes and if you're trying to commit fraud what would you do based on your knowledge of the homeowners association this is what brainstorming is how anyone might misappropriate asset of the entity for example for the homeowners association they might buy supplies to paint um, can would anybody be stealing those supplies how the auditor might respond to susceptibility of material misstatement due to fraud. Then we need to ask ourselves, if fraud is found, let's let's think proactively. What should we do? How should we approach this? Okay, so this is basically communication among the audit team. So for example, for the homeowners association, what, what did we talk about? I still remember a few things, vendor invoices. We want to see the vendor invoices. Are they reasonable? Maybe the, the person in charge of this home, homeowners association is using vendors um, that they're not really, uh, you know, they're legitimate vendors, but what's happening is they're charging the homeowners association more than the fair market value. And why? Well, because maybe the managers of the homeowner association is getting a cut, basically some sort of a commission to use those vendors. We would say we want to look at cash receipts and cash disbursement. This is important. Who are they paying? Who are they paying? Again, fair market value is important vendor contract are they given certain vendors preference treatment among other other vendors are they hiring relatives and friends to do the work can we find anything like this those are the things that we talked about okay so we basically this is what we will document copies of signed contract and leases let's look at the signed contract and leases um, are they at fair market value okay are they, for example, um, renting uh, one of the homeowners association or the fees, they're, they're undercharging them uh, money for the homeowners association? Those are the things that that you discuss during the brainstorming session. And by the way, this was a small audit. Again, it was a, a day or a day and a half. I remember we had to come back the next day for some reason. But in, the re in, a, in a bigger audit, this discussion is ongoing. As you discover new stuff, you want to talk to the other the, the, the other people hold on a second I, I think sales doesn't look good here could you check your account receivable to see if this makes sense so this discussion is ongoing among the team members and as I said you always have to document this process okay the other source of of uh, of, uh, of uh, evidence or the other source of fraud risk assessment is simply inquiries of management and what's inquiries just go ahead and talk to people talk to people at the company who should you talk to practically everyone who should you talk to talk to management people who are responsible for financial reporting and people who are in operation they're not responsible for financial reporting they're responsible for shipping the product okay talk to anyone and everyone employees again people who are working in the accounting department financial and operating purchasing agent inventory control individual just talk to them just say what's going on you know uh, could you tell me something about uh, uh, that i need to be aware of okay you need to talk about the internal auditor the legal counsel now what should you talk to them what should you talk to them about what's the key talk to them about the risk of fraud okay just ask them simply ask the employees what do you think of fraud what do you think of financial reporting and what you do by doing so, you're going to gauge in their attitude. Okay, they might say, well, ah, well, financial reporting is not that important. You know, here we're not really splitting here. So it gives you an idea about what do they think about fraud. Or they may say, well, that's based on our culture. That's not acceptable at all. 
you know, we take fraud very seriously. How they, how they answer to these questions gives you a lot of ideas. Another thing you want to ask them is about their awareness. Just simply ask them, are you aware of any fraud that's going on? And you'll be surprised sometimes. The employee might say, oh, yes, our purchasing agent, he always gives favors. You know, just you never know. So just you ask, you just ask, are you aware? And try to gauge their attitude. Just basically ask them, what happened if fraud occurred? What, what do you think would happen? Would that person be disciplined? Would they be fired? Or would management basically just ignore it? Okay, just get get their attitude about fraud. Okay, again, you're talking to all this, all these, all these people. Okay, ask them. Do you have any tips and complaints about fraud? Could you tell me something that's going on? Just give me. Can you give me a tip? Do you have any complaint that fraud is going on in this company? You can talk to them about any unusual, complex, or related party transaction. Do you have any unusual transaction? Are you aware of any unusual transaction? Are you aware of any related party transactions? Maybe management did not tell you about all the related party transactions. Just ask employees. They might tell you. Okay? So simply put, when you're talking to the employees in this process, I call it, I say, ask innocent, stupid questions. This is what I call it. Again, there is no term as innocent, stupid questions, but you got the point. You're just trying to see... What do you think? Just tell me. You know, I, I just want to know. I'm the auditor and uh, you're the expert here. Tell me what you know. So what are you looking for in, whole, the, the, in this whole process? You're looking for inconsistent responses. You're looking for um, inconsistent responses. Some people say there's fraud. Some people say there's not. Or some people say, well, we're ethical. Some people say we're not that ethical. So you're looking to probing to see if there's any also vague responses. Okay, if the responses are vague or unsatisfactory, they did not really, they try to avoid your question. Then you, you need to do, you need to look for more evidence. So that's what you're looking for when you inquire of management. And once again, you're only asking questions. Just talk to them and you'll be surprised. A lot of fraud is uncovered by an employee saying something. They were not aware that that piece of information is critical because the employee might see something very small. But as auditor, we see the big picture. But this small thing, we can make it fit in the big picture. The employee is not aware that this small item, whatever that item is, just to tell you the value of talking to the employee, one, 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 one fraud was uncovered when the security guard, the person that's in charge of the warehouse, asked the auditor, he, miss, he, miss, um, uh, he did not know that the person was the auditor, he asked the auditor, if you are the same company that came last night to, uh, uh, to bring the inventory in. So what's happening, the company was transporting inventory from where, one warehouse to the other. So when the auditor goes to the warehouse and the security guard thought the auditor was part of the team that's transporting inventory from one warehouse to the other, then the auditor asked, you know, could you, could you tell me a little bit more about this uh, inventory thing? What was happening, the company was taking inventory from warehouse, one warehouse overnight, transported to, to a second warehouse to do what? To count the inventory twice, to count the inventory twice. So the auditor uncovered this fraud by just talking to the security guard. And this is what I said. You ask innocent, stupid questions. Okay. Another, another source of, uh, another source of uh, evidence or for assessing fraud risk is an analytical procedures. What is analytical procedures? It's the study of data in the relationship among numbers. The, those numbers could be financial and non-financials. Okay. Now we talked about analytical procedure earlier. Basically it's required during the planning stage and during the final stage. Now you could also use it during the audit as a substantive procedure, but it's required during the planning and the final review to look at the overall pictures. So what do you do when you're looking at analytical procedures? Well, you're looking at ratios and numbers. You're comparing them to prior periods and competitors. So you're looking at the gross profit the profit margin of the company. Compare this to the prior period. Compare this to the industry. Well, if the profit margin at your company is going up and the industry going down, well, we need to know why, what's going on. Are you understating your inventory? Are you booking fictitious sales? We look at the account receivable turnover. Well, if there is a receive, well, if the economy slows down, we should see your receivable turnover is slowing down. Well, the, the over economy slow down and your account receivable st still on rising. Well, why? I mean, it's good that your account receivable rising, but uh, fraud could be occurring. Or the opposite. Inventory turnover, sales growth, spending on fixed asset, current ratio and working capital, changes in your capital structure. You're moving from debt to equity or from equity to debt. 
horizontal analysis, vertical analysis. Now, this analytical procedure, I'm not really giving you any justice here. I'm just listing them. The reason I'm doing so, because we did cover them in four recording prior to this recording. So analytical procedures, I explain analytical procedures in four different recording, and that's why I don't want to do it again. Plus examples, so you can go to my other channel and look at analytical procedures. This is just to give you an idea how, how it works. Now also, again, you would look at the fraud risk factor. You would look at any other information that, that's helpful to help you assess fraud. But don't forget, whatever you do when you're assessing fraud, you have to document this process. And why do you have to document this process? I'm going to ask you this question. Do you remember what you had for dinner last night? Okay, do you remember? Or do you have to think about it? Wait for a moment and think about it. Think about sitting in front of a judge, maybe two, three years down the road, and asking you, why did you perform a certain procedure two or three years ago? Do you remember? And the answer is, most likely, you are not going to remember. So that's why you need to document the, the this assessment, the fraud risk assessment, because down the road, you might be responsible for answering questions about what you did two or three years ago. And if you remember what you did two, three years ago, that's good, but most probably, you are not going to remember. So that's why, and not remembering is in a sense, it's going to be it's going to be looked at negatively as if you are trying to avoid the answer. Okay, now, but also you have to remember assessment continues throughout the audit. Why? Because as you learn new information about the company, like for example, as we learn more about the homeowner association, again we're going to reassess our procedures because now we have new information. Okay, a few things we need to be aware of. Auditing standard require that the auditor presume there is a risk of fraud. We presume that there is a risk of fraud when it comes to revenue recognition. There is always a risk of fraud because fraud mostly occur in revenue recognition, most fraud. So that's always, we always assume that there is a fraud in revenue recognition, the fraud in the way the company is recording revenue, and management override of control. And there's always a risk that management might be overriding the control. So if the auditor conclude that this assumption does not apply, if we say, well, now, they, they have a proper revenue recognition uh, and the company, uh, the management uh, has integrity. If we do come to that conclusion, we have to document why. We must document why did we not assume that there is a fraud in revenue recognition. It doesn't mean there is, but we have, we have to assume because it's a risky account, revenue recognition, as well as there is a risk when management override the control. That's the, that's the worst risk. So we have to document what we did. And if we say they're not risky, we need to document why not. What else do we need to document? Significant decisions made during the discussion among the engagement team personnel. Remember when we did this discussion in the in the van? Again, don't, don't look at the van as a good example, just kind of help you remember. We have to document this discussion. You know, what did we do? What did we say? What, what was the most important point? Okay procedures perform? What procedures did they perform to obtain information necessary to identify and assess the risk of material misstatement? What, what procedures did we perform? Document this process. Specific risk of material fraud were identified at both the overall financial statement and the assertion level. Any specific risk that we identified, document this. And description of the auditor response. How did you respond to this? Result of the procedures performed to address the risk of management override of control. If we find any management override, what was the procedures? Again, this happens after the audit, okay? But we need to document this. Other conditions and analytical relationship indicating that additional auditing procedures or other responses were required. If from analytical procedures, we saw that their gross profit is higher than the industry. What did we do? Did we check their inventory? Did we check their sales? Did we recompute their cost of goods sold to see if there's something was misclassified in cost of goods sold? Document this process. How did we respond? And the nature of communication about fraud made to management, the audit committee, or others. The nature of communication, what did they tell us about fraud? Just document this. How was What was their attitude? Document this, because you are going to forget if you don't document it. Because again, what's the risk? The risk is down the road. The auditor is sued, and we don't remember what we did. And that's not good. The, the jury or the judge may not like our responses that we don't remember. We, it's truly, we don't remember. Again, we don't remember what we had for lunch last night or for dinner last night. But how do we expect to remember what we did two years ago? And it's, it involves some paperwork. Okay, so that's basically the assessing and documenting fraud. The next thing I'm, we're going to look at is the uh, corporate governance oversight to reduce fraud. So what is the company's role overall? What's the, what is the corporate 
structure to help us reduce the fraud because our responsibility is reasonable assurance. But obviously the management is responsible for maintaining that tone at the top that fraud doesn't take place. So in the next session, we would look at that topic. If you have any questions, any comments, by all means, email me or see me in class. And if you're studying for your CPA, obviously study hard.